Jeremiah, the very nature of God in him, he wept a lot of times when he preached. A lot of times Jeremiah got put in prison for preaching this, and that wasn't why he was weeping. He was weeping because God's people would not believe and respond. In other words, they wouldn't do nothing he was telling them. And a lot of times, Brother Rob, what made him weep is because he knew before he went to them and told them they weren't going to listen. Amen. They weren't going to obey what he was saying. I'm going to tell you, that's a burden like you don't even want to tote. It's a burden that's beyond. I'm telling you, if you really called, it'll, you, you'll walk into it. Amen. And, 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 and it's a burden like I can't even explain. I can't even find the words to tell you about it. Amen. Because it's, 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 it's a burden that, that's, that's, that's from God. It comes from God. God's grieving. God knows sometimes because he knows everything. He declares the end from the beginning. Isaiah 49 verses 10. He knows who's going to believe and who's not going to believe. He knows who's going to listen and who's not going to listen. But nobody's going to stand before him and say, God didn't tell us. There's sometimes I'm preaching things. There's sometimes I've been places and sometimes I've preached to people. And I've looked at them while I'm preaching. And I know, Brother Rob, they're not going to do nothing I say. But yet God requires me and it's a burden. It becomes so heavy and weighty. He still requires me to preach it again. And all you can hear them say is, there he goes again. And they don't even realize God's trying to talk to them. But somebody say that hour runs out. That window closes eventually. Uh, Revelation 2.21 says he gave the harlot a space to repent and she repented not. That's in reference to old wicked witch, you know, Jezebel. Amen. He gave even Jezebel a space to repent, but she wouldn't. She tried to kill the prophets. Amen. And uh, it was the prophets' words that brought her down. And she was ate up by the dogs. Praise God. Even God extended his mercy to her, a witch. Come on, a bell worshiper. But she would not repent. And so Proverbs 29, verses 1, the Bible says, you know, if you're often reproved and you keep hardening your neck, you keep rebelling. Amen. God, you know, gives a warning there. And, and I'm going to read that before we get it in Jeremiah 5 because I'm going to make sure I got it right. I don't want to just be quoting, you know, off the cuff there and, and, and miss out a word. I mean, I, I got the words in my spirit, but I'm feeling like a something one word or two that maybe I'm going to leave out and I want to make sure I get get it fully. Yeah, he that being often reproved and hardened his neck. What's a hard neck mean? Stiff neck, same thing. Won't turn. I've literally watched people, demon possessed and not, do the same thing. I've watched them do that. I've watched them turn their head away and not look at me when I'm, when I'm speaking true. Amen. I've watched the demon possessed do it as demons manifest on. Amen. So it can be both sometimes. He that often is reproved, that means rebuke. God tries to correct them. They harden their neck. That means they will not turn. Shall suddenly be destroyed in that without remedy. Then verses 2 of Proverbs 29 says, When the righteous are in authority, the people rejoice. But when the wicked bear rule, the people mourn. Wow. And that even goes into a national level of rebellion. And don't you think for one minute that the rebels, the leaders, even in nations are going to get away with anything they're doing. Amen. When God says that, see it. And a lot of times we wonder, God, why ain't you done something about these people? Why ain't you done something? Because he's given them like he did, amen, Jezebel. He's given them a space of grace. He's given them a moment to repent. Longer than a moment. Some of them he's given a whole lifetime. You ever wonder why, my God, why somebody so wicked live so long and seem like they just keep getting away with it and just keep prospering and gaining? It's like they can't get caught by the, God is extending grace to them, trying to open their eyes, but their hour will come. Friends, somebody, everybody say eternity is forever. Wow. Hell. Some people, that's going to be their judgment. That's, it's going to be that. They're going, they're going to go to hell because they would not turn. But they will not stand before God before they're cast into hell and say, you never told me. You never said nothing to me. God's going to say to that politician that's wicked, that old baby killer, amen, that says it's okay to kill unborn babies. Come on, somebody. Hallelujah. That deceived the people and led the masses off against his word and made them antichrist. They're going to stand before him before they get thrown into hell. Hallelujah. And they're going to say, you never told us. And he's going to say, yes, I told you often. Remember those times you selected scriptures out of my Bible and you read it before people to get their vote, but you didn't read all of it. You just said parts. Remember them times at them prayer sessions you had politically? 
because it's the, you know, political thing to do and you present yourself as God-fearing, but yet, hello, God's going, somebody say no excuse. There'll be no excuse. Nobody will be able to give an excuse. And turn. So their judgment will come. Proverbs 3 talks about the day's going to come when God's going to laugh at their calamity. He's going to laugh at it. Somebody say their hour of judgment will come. Nobody's escaping. Nobody's getting away with nothing. Somebody say nothing. If the blood of Abel cried out from the ground in Genesis 4.10 against Cain, his brother, that murdered him, that's the first murder. Think about it. Don't you know that the blood of over 60 million unborn babies cry out to God? Can you imagine having to carry the pressure of that load of all those infants dead? Come on, somebody. But yet now they're around the throne of God and their blood that was shed innocently before they could even be born cries out to God in judgment against those who permitted it and allowed it and who are unrepented toward God. Come on. Now you can repent of it and God will forgive you and it'll be like it was never done but not those that harden their neck. Come on. Can you imagine the punishments that's going to come? Uh, amen. Uh, just, you know, uh, a couple of days ago it was, uh, you know, the 78th anniversary. Amen. Praise God of, you know, uh, when Hitler had slain, you know, what was was it, was it 6,000? Six million. I don't know why I said thousands. Six million Jews, and that ain't counting, you know, the other people that died in that horrific, terrible war, World War II. Amen. And, and I thought about Hitler. I, I thought about it. I said, boy, he's alive right now in hell. I'd hate to be in, I'd hate to be anywhere in hell, but I sure wouldn't want to be where he's at. Oh, come on, anybody. Forever and forever. Think about it. Praise the Lord God. And, and, and I, I just thought about it. Nobody's getting away with There's no evil dictator. There's no evil politician. Uh, come on, there's no no evil person, no wicked person. If they're still breathing, that's God's mercy trying to give them a chance to repent. Somebody say he's giving them a space of grace. But woe unto those that keep hardening their necks. Boy, Hitler sounds like a choir boy, don't he? Six million compared to 60 million. Think about it. Unborn babies that's been killed. What a holocaust in our lifetime. This month makes 50 years. Even today, amen, or it used to be, is the national, you know, day where, you know, Preachers used to preach against abortion. Praise God. They'd cry out. Sometimes they'd stand on the street corners. We've done it too. I hadn't heard nothing about it, but uh, I don't have to wait to the day to preach it because I preach about it all the time. Hallelujah. Praise God. And, and, uh, and so anyhow, nobody's getting away with nothing. If the blood of one man can cry out to God and God bring punishment against his murderer and take Cain and evict him from the garden, <laughs> amen, and send him out there into the land of Nod, Read it sometime. That's where, that's where we get the statement nodding off. Amen. Some people, that's their judgment. God just lets them nod off. He just lets them go to sleep spiritually. He just lets them have what they want. He gives it to them. Somebody say it's God's judgment. Somebody say God's judgment sometimes comes by way of giving people what they want. He just lets them have it. Judgment hit this land years ago when God allowed them. Who? He allowed you know, those that want to marry the same sex, he let them have it legalized. He let them. He allowed them. He gave them what they want. What they want. He, he's let them do these things, amen, as part of his judgment. Somebody say it's God's judgment. Praise God. And so in the book of Romans chapter 1, and we'll be back to Jeremiah 5 in just a moment. I ain't even got started reading there. But in Romans chapter 1, we know how in verse 25 they change the truth of God into a lie. And when they do that, they worship themselves. They worship the creature. It's called humanism. Come on, somebody. And so they worship themselves rather than God, the creator that's blessed forever and ever. Amen. And then it talks about how in verse 26, for this cause, somebody say, for this reason, God, listen to this, also gave them up. You ever heard people say, you ever heard a preacher say, God never gives anybody up. Yes, he does. Amen. He'll give up a whole generation. Yes. God will never give up on you. Wrong! 
Come on, somebody. That's what that old sleazy, amen, uh, grace preacher, and I ain't talking about the grace that brings salvation. I'm talking about the sleazy one. Come on, somebody. It tells you you can keep on sinning. They'll tell you you got forever. God will never give up on you. But right here, the very statement is because they change the truth of God into a lie, and their worship becomes their own opinions, their own humanistic ideas. Now, let's change, you know, what God has said in order as natural between a man and a woman Amen. And God says, I'll call to them and say, repent. I'll preach. I'll send them preachers. I'm going to show you where Jeremiah even talks about how God sent preacher to them after, amen, message after message. And they keep saying, no, we're not going to walk that way. We're not going to do it. And God says, okay, here's my judgment. Somebody say, verse 26 of Romans 1 is God's judgment revealed. It says, God also gave them up. Somebody say to uncleanness. Through the lust of their own hearts. Here's the uncleanness. He specifically describes it. The lust of their own hearts, not love. He said to dishonor their own bodies. Listen to this. Between themselves. They dishonor their bodies. He's talking about sexual relationships. Amen. This is verse 24 of Romans 1. And then he talks about verse 25, how they've changed the truth of God into a lie, like we've been preaching. And they worship themselves, the creature rather than the creator, which is blessed forever and all men. Verse 26 now of Romans 1, for this cause, here it is again, God gave them up. Here it is, unto vile, not acceptable, but vile affections. And he's talking about sexually. For even their women did change the natural use into that which is against nature. Meaning, women are no longer lying with a man sexually, their husband. Women are wanting to be married to women. Women are wanting to have sexual relationships with women. It's been updated. It's called lesbianism. Verses 27. Come on, I'm preaching what got me kicked, what got our church kicked off of YouTube months ago. Come on. Hallelujah. Praise God. Hey, hey, amen. What'd you do? The very next service I could do, I did one again. Praise God. And it worked. It got us off there for good. Then. Hallelujah. Amen. In verse 27, and likewise, listen, also the men. Yes. Leaving the natural use of the woman, burned in their lust, not love, one to another. Men, somebody say with men, he's talking about sexually, working that which is unseemly, unimaginable, don't even make no sense. It's, and receiving in themselves the recompense of the error that was meet. In verse 28, even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge. In other words, when God would speak, they would fight against it. No, I don't want to hear that. God gave them over. He doesn't say it twice, I gave them up. Now he says, I give them over. To a reprobate mind. A reprobate means now they can't even discern between what a man is and what a woman is. No wonder they can't discern what a baby is. They can't even tell you. That's why Proverbs 1.22 says in here also, they profess themselves to be wise, but they become fools. You is as foolish as they come if you can't look at a woman that's pregnant and say, you're going to have a baby. That's a baby right now in your womb. You, you a fool. You a professing fool. I don't care how many degrees you got and how many colleges and universities you graduated from. I, come on, somebody. Hallelujah. If you can't look at a woman and say she's a woman, amen, and look at a man and say he's a man. Well, I just really don't know. I just can't. I, I can't. How can we tell? It's real easy. God made two, male and female, and he blessed them. Genesis 1, verses 28. God didn't make male, female, and they, or them. He made a him and a her, not a them and a they and a those, and all these different pronouns. I'll give you a pronoun. God bless them. <laughs> male and female. Read it in Genesis 1, 26 through 28. Somebody say, there's your them. And they're they. Well, you know, you can't call somebody a he. You can't call somebody a she. Just call them a, a they or a them or a those. I reckon if you woke, but we too awake to be awoke. Come on, anybody hear the Holy Ghost? We're alert and awake in the spirit, and we're going to just say what the Bible says. Amen. But we don't like that, so let's change it. And after a while, years go by, years go by, and the agenda keeps being thrown. Amen. And people, we want it our 
some way and they think somehow things have become revolutionary in the nation we live and people are now accepting it. No. God was the sustaining force of that nation. God was holding that back. But because of their continuous rebellion, God says, okay, I give you up, I give you up, and I give you over. Somebody say it's judgment. You're seeing judgment in America. But don't you think for a minute, just like Sodom and Gomorrah in Genesis 19, amen, God ain't going to let it slide by. Anybody hear the Holy Ghost? Matter of faith, we're in in the New Testament and in Acts 17 and 30 now in the New Covenant he says I command every man everywhere to repent but we don't want to be told to repent to change we want God to change we want everybody to accept the new change in this new world order and that now somehow you can be a Christian homosexual a Christian lesbian and you might can be a Christian but you can't be a Christian because God the only pronoun God blessed was a them and a them consisted of a him and a her Genesis 1 28 come on amen you can put on the bathroom as you advertise you can put a man there you can put a little woman in a dress there and then you can have a man with pants on one side and a dress on the other side and call it all gender but the Bible tells us what all gender is male and female anybody hear the Holy Ghost and any other definition thereof is an abomination and it's a revolt against God it's a revolt against God. And God will let people do what they want to eventually. Some might say that's judgment. That's the worst judgment when God says, I'll remove my spirit and let you do what you want. Because my Holy Ghost, my spirit of truth was the only one constraining you from destroying yourself. And them big mouth preachers that you called haters. You know what? You know what? In Sodom and Gomorrah, do you realize in, in, in Genesis 19, 14, that Lot's son-in-laws called him a mocker? When you study that word mocker, that means somebody that makes fun of, puts down, you know, you know speaks against abruptly, you know, you know disdaining. Way. They called Lot a, a, a mocker because he told them he was a righteous preacher. And you read First Peter, it talks about, and he preached to them, escape for your life. Get out of here. God's about to send fire and brimstone. He's going to judge this city because of her sexual perversions. Angels came, and one of them was the Lord, came to Sodom and Gomorrah. And when they came in Lot's house that night, all the men of the city, read it in Genesis 19. This stuff ain't nothing new. They came to Lot's house. Lot tried to offer his virgin daughters, his two virgin daughters to these men. Amen. Because he didn't want them trying to sexually, you know, those perverts to, to mess with God's angels. Amen. That wasn't going to happen anyhow, but Lot was trying his best. And they didn't want the two virgin daughters. All those group of men wanted those angels that looked like men. They, they, they looked like men to the carnal eye. We want them. And the angels struck them with blindness. Friend, there's a striking of blindness that has happened in the hour we live. People are blind. Why? Because it's God's judgment. You remember in the Bible, in the book of Acts, amen, where Peter's preaching and this witch comes up and tries to turn away the heart of the deputy. Amen. Glory to God, that uh, uh, political leader from hearing the gospel. Amen. And, and, and the prophet of God speaks and blindness comes on that witch and they have to lead him away blindly. Somebody shout, we're living in an hour where that's God's judgment. Blindness comes. He lets them have what they want for an end time of judgment that he's going to pour out eventually. Amen. Praise God. So they called him a mocker. They do the same thing today when the righteous preacher preaches. Oh, you, it would be identified today, kind of defined as you're, you're one that promotes hate. You speak hate. You know, I've been accused of that. Hate speech, I've been accused by that by socialists. Come on, somebody, YouTube. I've been accused by that even on Facebook before. Amen. They identify me as one who speaks hate. I've had people do that. I've had people come to church here and leave here and said that about me. Amen. Praise God. Just get in line behind the devil. Hallelujah. Amen. They said, Lot, you're a hater. You're a mocker. Oh, you, you, you're speaking against us. You, don't, you just don't understand. Amen. But his two son-in-laws had to be homosexual too because how in the world because his two daughters still be virgins and they're married to them. Amen. 
Think about it. Think about it. You ain't never seen that, have you? Hey, Amen. How can, how can a man's two daughters be virgins still? Hey, Amen. And they're married to two men. Because the two men were homosexuals too. That's why they hated Lot for preaching what he preached. Amen. And they all got judged. They, amen. They didn't want to be told we're doing anything wrong. You got to accept us or else. Yeah, or else. God will turn you over. Woe unto you when you're not convicted anymore. When you're not bothered anymore by your lifestyle. It used to be a time where people try to hide in the closet. They try to hide it. And, and, and in a sense, that's God's mercy. When they're trying to cover up their sin, they're trying to hide it. That means they still blush about it. They know in their conscience something's wrong. The Holy Ghost bears witness in our conscience. Amen. Romans 9 verses 1. And so, and they're still bothered by it. But now we're about to find in the book of Jeremiah, they don't even blush no more. They, they're not even ashamed of their doings no more. That is judgment. When people, are no, when people can no longer blush, when they're no longer convicted, when it no longer makes them hang their head, you've watched people sit in courtrooms that have killed people and smile, showing no emotion. That's judgment. God's judgment's on them. It's called a reprobate mind. Reprobate means they have a, become a castaway. God has rejected them. Somebody say reprobate means God has rejected them. He's rejected them. They wanted their way so long, he just gives it to them finally. And he gave them up. So in Jeremiah 5, can't you see why Jeremiah has always heard weeping, crying? Not because he's getting put in prison for preaching. Jeremiah's preaching to a people he knows a lot of times ain't going to listen to him. But God, God in his holiness is not going to let nobody stand before him and say, you didn't warn us. You didn't tell us again and again and again and again and again and again. More times than we can even count. God calling out to people, reaching out to them, trying to get them to open their eyes. Amen. Praise God. And uh, so li listen to this in Jeremiah 5 verse 21. He said, hear now this, old foolish people. Boy, no wonder Jeremiah got put in prison. He called his own people he was preached to, called them fools. Mm -hmm. Old foolish people. And without understanding, somebody shot, he just called his own people dumb. Called them stupid. Yeah, really, that's what he said. You stupid. He said, Here's why. Which have eyes and see not. Which have ears and hear not. Don't mean they can't see. They won't see. Don't mean they can't hear. They just won't hear. They got a hard neck. They won't turn their eyes. They won't. They won't turn their eyes from evil things and turn their eyes to him. They won't turn their ear. They got itchy ears. They heaped in themselves teachers having itchy ears and they're turned from the truth and turned to fables. 2 Timothy 4 verse 3 and verses 4 declares. Amen. Look at verse 23 of Jeremiah 5. He said, but this people have a revolting and rebellious heart. Revolt, rebellion, same thing. It just means they were double rebellious. Doubly rebellious in mind and in heart. They revolt rebellious to rebel means to resist, but to revolt means they then argue against the truth. They then fight the truth. I find sometimes, and I've seen, you know, in 32 years of ministry, I found people that would rebel, but I hadn't found a lot of revolters. But in the hour we live, I find more revolters, not just people that rebel, but they revolt. Some of them's demon possessed. That's why they can't leave the church and just leave it alone. They got to still keep attacking. They want to see things destroyed. They want to see you destroyed. They want to see the people of God go down. It's really nothing but, you know, modern witchcraft. And, 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 and says, says there, they are revolted and gone. Somebody say they revolted and they're gone. In other words, when God speaks to them, they get mad. And part of their revolt is they go. They leave mad. They leave mad. All right. He tells them right here. Let me, let me let's, let's, let's go on and look in chapter 6 because this is where I really want to go. Let's go to verse 31 of Jeremiah 5 first. The last verse in Jeremiah 5 verse 31. And the prophets prophesy falsely and the priests bear rule by their own means. That means they take it into their own hands. Instead of being led by the spirit, they give the people what they want. They do it by their own. They just do it by their own hands. 
They take it. They take the church into their own hands. They, they give the people what they want. They prophesy lies falsely. They tell the people what they want to hear is what this, this is what this means. Amen. He said, and my people love to have it so. Wow. So the false prophet Jeremiah is preaching against, warning the people about. And the priests that take it in their own hands, they take the church out of God's hand and put it in theirs. They're the ones that appease to please the people. They cater to the crowds. To give them what they want. Because why? Why, is it, why do you believe that? Because it tells us right there, it says, and my people love to have it so. In other words, they give them what the people want. They tell the people what they want to hear. They give the people what they want to get the people to come. And the people to stay. They don't want to offend nobody. God calls that preacher a false prophet. He calls him a false priest. Amen. Which is the same as saying pastor. He said, and what will you do in the end thereof? In other words, that's judgment. God says it won't last. It won't last. If you take my church in your own hands and you cater to the crowds and you tell them to give them what they want so you can merchandise them and get the crowds and get the people, amen, and you lie to them, it ain't going to last. What you going to have when it all ends? Mm. In other words, what's it going to look like in eternity? It may dress up fancy and look ooh, real productive and growth wise on social media. Hallelujah. But how's it going to look in eternity? I ask myself in the spirit, Brother Lamont, that sometimes. How's what I'm doing going to look in eternity? Who cares how it looks good on a, on a screen? Or how it looks good in a little, you know, opt of, you know, little prop of, of a picture that was snapped. And what it looked like, you know, glory. What's God say? How's it going How's it going to look when I stand before him? I'll tell you how it's going to look. It's going to be judged by. Not some picture, but what come out of my mouth. Did I say what God said, even when the people didn't want to hear it? Or did I tell them what they wanted to hear? Come on, did I become, a, amen, glory to God, the preacher of the people? Or did I preach to the people because I was God preacher and say what God said? Anybody hear the Holy Ghost? Amen. He said in verses 1 of chapter 6 of Jeremiah, Oh, ye children of Benjamin, gather yourselves to flee out of the midst of Jerusalem. Blow the trumpet in Tekoa and set up a sign of fire. In, I can't even pronounce it. For evil appeareth out of the north in great destruction. Somebody says he's telling them to flee. Somebody says that's what a real preacher would do. That's what a real prophet would do. They'll stand up in front of you and say flee from that. Flee from it. Kind of sounds like the apostle Paul at the church at Corinth in 1 Corinthians 6, 18. Amen. He didn't tell them stand by faith against fornication. He said flee fornication. He told them to run from it. He told them to get away from it. Flee it. The prophet's standing up telling the people, judgment's coming. He's got a, he's got a shofar in his hand and he's sounding the trumpet, Sister Dana, and he's, and he's warning them, flee, because he's talking about judgment's coming. Oh, we don't want nobody to tell us to leave nothing. We just want to believe, but we don't want to leave nothing. We just want to believe and keep everything we got, amen, and keep it as it is and let Jesus become an addition to our life, amen. But we don't want to repent. Flee means repent. Flee would be him crying out, repent. Tire away from that. Long before there was a John the Baptist saying it, amen. Verses two, he said, for I have likened the daughter of Zion, that means God's people, to a calmly delicate woman. Calmly would mean, you know, accepted. It would be, it kind of means a word for an acceptance, but it also talks about a physical beauty as well. But listen what the word calmly right here in context of this scripture in Jeremiah 6 2 when you study it in Hebrew. It literally means this sentence, this little short word, dwelling at home. In Jeremiah 6 and 2, the prophet Jeremiah is crying and weeping, telling his people to turn from the way you've been going. Stop going this way. He's sounding the trumpet. He's sounding the alarm. He's preaching a message of repentance that gets him locked up sometimes. Just, yeah, they don't like it. And he's weeping and he's crying. And he said, I liken God's people. I liken Zion as a woman that just dwells at her home. That just stays at her house. Think about it. 
the one with the issue of blood my god if she'd have stayed in her house she'd have died with an issue of blood but somebody shot she left quarantine and she went to where he was and virtue flowed out and she was healed miraculously anybody hear the holy ghost uh, and god made her well well she represents in luke 8 uh, a portrait of the church today that's got an issue come on somebody she's bleeding and when you study the levitical law a woman that was bleeding from her private area this way amen glory to god they would consider them unclean just like someone with leprosy so she was told you cannot be among the community you can't come to where you got to be quarantined the rest of your life or until you're made clean until the priest says you're healed amen but 12 long years she suffered spent everything she had earned and got worse and not better physicians couldn't help her oh but glory to god when she come out of her house and disobeyed the law amen of the religion of that hour and said I'm going to where he is she touched his garment amen and virtue flowed out and she got healed and I'm telling you she suffered from a private problem Somebody shout, she had an issue of blood from her private area. She represents the church to us today. The church today has got a private issue. She's got an issue. Somebody say an issue. She's bleeding from her communication with the Lord. She's bleeding. She's allowed the altar of the Lord to stay vacant and to become empty in the houses of the Lord. She's like Jeremiah prophesied, likened Zion, God's daughter, his people. Amen. Amen. Calmly, they're just dwelling at their home. Amen. They've left his house. They no longer come to seek him in fellowship with him and, and, and those that are his. Amen. Somewhere corporately. Somebody say they're dwelling at their house. That's the issue. It kind of sounds a lot like today. It's amazing when you start studying the Bible what you see. Not just reading. I found that out this morning. I ain't never seen that in 32 years. You study the word calmly in Jeremiah 6 too. It literally means to dwell at home. Amen. Hallelujah. Somebody say, it is not in the Bible. I'm a Christian, and I don't have to go to church. That is not in the Bible. He said, don't forsake it. Hebrews 10, 25, what? The assembly. Oh, yeah. Glory to God. So, Jeremiah, let's go on in Jeremiah 6, because i got to move through this. Verse 13, he said, from the least of them, even unto the greatest of them. Everyone is given to covetousness, which Colossians 3, 4 calls idolatry. So 1 Timothy 6 and 10 calls it the love of money. That's the root of all evil. Kind of sounds a lot like church today, don't it? Worldliness is what it means. They're more concerned about this life and what it has to offer. About the gain from this world now than they are about that that's eternal. Somebody say they're all given to covetousness. They've given themselves for the lust of money, the pride of life. They've, they, they, they've they got so caught up in this world that now they excuse themselves from the eternal things, the things concerning God's kingdom because of the cares of life that now have choked them and they become unfruitful, Mark 4, verses 19. Somebody say they're given to idolatry and their idol is making a dollar. Hello? They're the ones that can't give God 10% a cup, a drink out of the 10. Come on, think about it. Amen. And, and, and because this life is more important to them than the so-called life they profess that's eternal that they're headed to. He said, from the prophet even to the priest, everyone dealeth falsely. Makes sense, don't it? Some might say when the preacher's false, so will the people. I don't necessarily blame all the people that's going astray. They went astray because the preacher, the preacher, the preacher. Boy, it's strange to hear these kind of men. I've had people say, Brother Mark, it's strange to hear you preach what you preach. I like where you've been going to hear preaching at. Hello? What Bible you been reading out of? Has it been one of these new revised? Come on, somebody, interpretations where they remove out all this stuff? Come on, anybody hear the Holy Ghost? You got people so mixed up, biblically illiterate, deceived, I've had them get offended with me and say, hey, you should mind your own business and quit telling me how to live. Somebody shout the preacher. 
is called to preach and tell us that there's a life to live, a new life. It's one by faith. So if I ain't telling you how to live, I ain't preaching. Amen. Somebody say preaching involves telling folks this is what you're supposed to do. This is what you're not supposed to do. We need some spirit-filled preachers to teach us right from wrong. We need some old-fashioned seekers who pray Long. Amen. Somebody say, we need some spirit-filled preachers to teach us right from wrong. I remember years ago when I first heard that in the spirit. I heard it before I got saved. That's how old that song is. But I remember when I first heard it in the spirit for the first time. When that first verse starts off, we need some, you know, spirit-filled preachers to teach us right from wrong. I'll never forget the Holy Ghost telling me. He said, they hit it right on target. He said, because that's what I called you to do, to preach right from wrong. <laughs> Come on, Lord of God. If the preacher ain't bringing up about what's wrong and all he's telling you is what's right, he's wrong. And if all he's doing is preaching about what's right, come on, you, you understand what I'm saying? And if all they're doing is preaching to you what's wrong but not telling you what's right, they're wrong. Yeah. You got to preach discernment between the two. And, and, and right here is how we navigate it. Right here, this, this is, you know, the roadmap that tells us how to walk, how to live. Amen. All right. So verse 14 Listen to what he talks about the false prophets. They have healed also the hurt of the daughter of my people slightly. Somebody say slightly. Slightly. It's got warmer in here. Amen. Slightly. Slightly means a little bit, but not all the way. Slightly could even mean half the way, but not all the way. Somewhat. Just a little bit. Few. Shortly have slightly healed my people. It's almost like somebody, you know, they're bleeding to death and you walk up there instead of putting pressure on it, grabbing some bandages, calling 911, you just walk up there and go, it'd be all right. You bleeding to death. You got a major artery that is that's severed. Blood shooting out every time your heart. Is, and they just walk up there and they, they do this, brother Rob. They just say, it's going to be okay. That's the image that Jeremiah is preaching that the false prophet do. They come up and they just tell the people, it's going to be all right. They say peace when there's no peace. They tell the people what they want to hear for just the crowd and for that and some of that. And they slightly heal them. About like somebody like the Holy Ghost said the other night in a, in a, in a message of judgment. Took me 18 minutes and something to prophesy that message of judgment. It's recorded. If you weren't here, you don't know nothing about it. Go watch it. Hallelujah. God spoke. Amen. And he said in there, he said, they have slightly healed my people. I remember him saying it because he was saying it through me. And he said, it's like they poured sugar on a cancer. Of course, you know, cancer's food is sugar. It lives off, a, it lives off sugar. Made it feel better. Come on, somebody. Made it a little, sweetened it up a little bit, but underneath it was still a disease. And that's what he's showing here. I thought about that scripture when God was prophesying through me, because if I'm prophesying what he's saying, you're going to find it in scripture. And he said that. Hey, man, this is the scripture right here in Jeremiah 6, verse 14. He said, They've slightly healed the people. Here's what they're saying saying, Peace, peace, when there's no peace. Telling them simply, it's going to be okay when it's not. Telling them they're okay. I want to go where they tell me I'm all right. I don't want them to, I don't want to go where they tell me you need to flee this. You need to leave that. I just want to be celebrated when I go somewhere. I don't want somebody in my business telling me how to live, preaching to me what's right or wrong. I want them to tell me what God's going to do. But somebody shout, there is no peace to the wicked, saith the Lord. Somebody shout, if you're going to have the peace of God, you got to make peace with God through his son, Jesus Christ. And so they're revolters, they're rebellious. They don't want, they, they want to rewrite not only history, but they got to rewrite the Word of God first. His story. Uh, verse 15, he said, were they ashamed when they had committed abominations? Now just to give you a simple definition of the word abomination, somebody say what God hates. Oh, these preachers, these false ones, they never talk about what God hates. They just, Jesus love you. 
Jesus loves me. That's all they ever talk about. Yeah. But somebody shout, Jesus loves me. But he'll never love sin. He loves sin, but he'll never wink at sin. He'll never accept wrong and call it right. Somebody shout, there's some things that are an abomination. Genesis 18, 22 said, if a man lays with another man sexually like he would a woman, it's an abomination. Anybody hear the Holy Ghost? God said in Proverbs 28 and verse 9, if you turn away your ear from hearing the truth, praise God when God speaks to you his word. God said even your prayer can become an abomination. God said he hates a proud look, Proverbs 6. He hates those who are swift to shed innocent blood. There's your abortionist. Your abor God hates it. Some of them say they sin, sin, but there's just some things God says in the abomination. He hates it. Amen. In Proverbs 17 and 15, he said, if, 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 if you associate the just with those that are wicked, come on somebody, amen, and you condemn the just, amen, when you're calling out the wicked and you put them all together, God says that's an abomination. You call right, right, where right is, and you call wrong, wrong, where wrong is. But you never associate wrong and right and slam them together and call them all wrong or call them all right. Either way, God calls that an abomination. That's Proverbs 17, 15, amen. So there's a balance. We called it balanced discernment the other, the other Sunday when we was preaching that. Hallelujah. So right here he says... When they had committed abominations, he said they weren't ashamed. Somebody would say they weren't convicted. He didn't make them go like that. But when I see people, I've had people around me and I just, they, uh, well, who are you? I said, well, I'm Pastor Marvin Booth. Oh, man, I'm sorry for talking. I had a potty mouth. I'm sorry for talking like that. I even told one guy one time, I said, well, just go ahead and flush it. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. And, and so it, it, that's a good thing. Somebody say it's a good thing when people's bothered by that. I can remember people years ago, they'd tell my wife, said, well, we're not going to come to your house. She said, why? This literally just happened several times. Because we know Brother Marvin's going to be there. And then tell him, say, if you write with God, what you worried about? Well, I'm afraid he's going to see something. And, and even as bad as that is, that's still a good thing. Because they're bothered by it. If you have to look over your shoulder to do it, that is the Holy Ghost bearing witness in your conscience. Romans 9.1. You may have just got away with it and think you got away with it, but you can't even enjoy it. Even though you got away with it because your heart grieves so bad. Because that's the Holy Ghost. Somebody say, if you lose that, it's called judgment. I tell people, as long as that's on you, mercy can be found. Mercy can be given. But woe unto us when we go so far away from that and we keep resisting that and harden our neck. That's what God's talking about in the scripture. And Jeremiah's weeping because he's preaching to a people that's at that point. They're no longer ashamed. My first revival I ever preached. By the way, I preached long then. First revival I ever preached. Some 30 or 31 years ago. It was in a double wide mobile home. It had been converted into a church. That first night I preached so hard against sin in the church, not the world. That literally before I could give an altar call. I watched people fall out of their pews, too specifically, crawling on their belly, weeping so hard you could hardly understand them. And when you did understand them, they were repenting of sin as they crawled to the altar. You ever seen somebody crawl to the altar? So distraught because of their deception and the way they was living. It's called godly sorrow. Amen. 1 Corinthians 7 and 10 says it's godless sorrow. Somebody say it works repentance. Now the false prophet that packs out the pew and the chair. Just tell, it'll be okay. Peace, peace. God understand. And I've watched preachers pray conviction off of people. I've had people come with Brother Marvin. I just feel so bad that I, I looked at one guy one time. I said, you're supposed to. He was waiting on me to make it, tell him something, make him feel better. I said, you're supposed to feel that way. I said, now you need to turn to God and you need to repent. Because that's the only way you're going to get that guilt off of you. Because somebody shot there's some guilt that is God guilt. Oh, no, he didn't. Yes, I did. Because it's found in your Bible and mine, in grandma's especially. In Romans 3, 19, God says, amen, that he comes to stop the mouth of all those that would testify of their own righteousness. Come on, somebody. Make them hold their mouth, amen, and become guilty 
before God. Somebody shout, that's what you gotta have. Somebody shout, you gotta have a God guilt before you can experience God's grace. And there's a presentation, amen, of a false grace from a false prophet and a false teacher of grace in the hour we live that's trying to give people a grace without first presenting to them, amen, a presentation of God's word, amen, glory to God that convicts them of their sin, amen, that can convert them into a saint, amen, because they felt guilty before God. If you're really born again, you felt guilty about the wrong you did. You didn't feel good about it. Oh, there was an old slave trader that wrote that famous song of all songs, Amazing Grace, and he wrote it in the first verse says, I once was blind, now I can see. He said, I was lost, now I'm found. Blind, but now I see. Said he saved a wretched, not a wonderful, a wretched man like me. Saved no wretched worm, sorry. Come on, somebody. That's how he got saved. Somebody say, we got to feel that way. But oh, come to our church where everybody feels good all the time. Where the atmosphere is just always pleasant and there's no judgment about anything. Just do whatever you want. God understands. Can't you just picture him right now? A yellowish, blue flaked, sugar coated lip. Oh, come on, somebody. Oh, but welcome to Sugar Free Ministries. Oh, glory to God. Sugar coating it, sweetening it up, slightly healing the people. Amen. Preacher told me one time, I said, Brother, when I preach, I don't want people to feel bad. I said, Quit, go get you another job. Amen. You know? Somebody say they're no longer ashamed. God help us when that that is wrong don't make us blush no more. This is what he's fitting to say. Neither could they blush. I call it the generation of the unblushables. They don't blush no more. When you see nakedness that you ain't married to from somebody else, it should make you blush. Somebody lift your hand and say, Holy Ghost, help me to blush again. When you say something you weren't supposed to say, you ought to blush. Come on, somebody. Somebody say when you do something you're not supposed to, somebody say you're supposed to blush. We're in an hour now where the false prophets uh, down at the first church of the unblushables, come on somebody, they don't want you blushing, uh, they just want you to feel good about everything. Who cares if Johnny can be good? Uh, hey man, let's just make him feel good. Uh, it's the feel good false doctrine. It ain't nothing but the doctrine of Jezebel and I'll show it to you in a moment to give you what you want. Uh, hey man, so we can take your soul to a devil's hell when your life here's over. Oh, and sugar coat it all the way slightly heal ya somebody say when we go to church we ought to blush every now and then something ought to make us feel a little ashamed every now and then oh glory because we're talking about a God who's holy he said neither could they blush listen to this therefore they shall fall among them that fall the word fall literally means to apostate to apostatize apostate apostasy somebody say this is the falling away he said, they'll fall among them that fall. Those that are falling away from the Lord can't blush no more. Amen. Nothing bothers them. Everything's okay. I remember when people used to blush and hang their head if they missed church a bunch in front of the preacher. Now they just... I remember when folks used to put their cigarette out. I remember when folks used to... I watched a man one time swallow his dip. I thought, boy, he's going to be sick. <laughs> Uh, I, I watched them grab their their, 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 their their can of beer. Oh, man. You know. Now they'll stand right with you and want to talk Jesus. Like ain't nothing, there's nothing wrong. Just curse his name and then want to talk about how good he's been to them and how oh, they don't even blush no more. Nothing bothers them no more. 
I remember growing up in the 80s, I, I was living wrong, living in sin, I, and you didn't have to preach to me. If I got around you and I knew you was a preacher, I was trying to don you. I, I could blush, I'd blush. I didn't want them to know what I was doing, I, even though most of the time I figured they probably already did. I, hey man, Lord of God, there were some things I weren't happy about, I, even though I felt I was having a happy time doing them. But when I got around certain people that I know was living with God, it bothered me. I, it convicted me. That's why I tried to skip church. I didn't want to go hear the gospel preach. Anybody hear the Holy Ghost? And I go and tell you, that's why some people who say they saints don't go to church no more than they do because they... Because they can selectively watch online and turn the chat. Oh, check this out. He said, they shall be cast down, saith the Lord. That's the same as saying in the New Testament, they're going to be reprobate. I'm, I'm giving them up. Turn them away to do what they want. All right. This in verse 16, it's up on the screen. Thus saith the Lord, stand ye in the ways. Somebody say, stand ye in the ways. That's plural. Somebody say, there's more than one way. Not to heaven, but there's more than one way. There's all kind of ways out there. There's all kind of ways. Oh, you can go this way, go that way. It all leads to the same God. That's the gospel, you know, of Oprah. You can go this way, that way, any way you want to. And you can make it to heaven. She's a liar. Truth ain't in her. And those preachers that rub elbows with her and they support her and she supports them, they're all false prophets. I don't care how popular they are and how famous they are. Anybody hear the Holy Ghost? You scared? Nah, I'm scared not to say it. Hallelujah. Anybody hear the Holy Ghost? Y'all think I come in here planning to preach like this? I don't. Amen. But, but I'm, I'm, telling you, I'm telling you the truth. I'm telling you the honest truth. He said there's many ways. God says, just stand there and look at all of them. Stand you in the ways. And see. Somebody say, see it. See. Look at them. Look where they lead. Yeah. Look where they go. My God, follow the street signs. It tells you where it's going to wind up at. Uh, he said, ask for the old paths. So somebody say, women, there must be some new ways there. They must look like there's some easier ways there. Mm, they built a new interstate right here. There's a broad one. But you know that old path's a narrow path. Sometimes it was that three path. Sometimes it was that two path. Just Pat and Turner would walk down it. It was a bumpy path, old path. It weren't even paved. But it had been pressed down because it was a path that had been frequently traveled down successfully. That brought people to that final eternal destination. Come on, somebody. Jesus preached it this way in Matthew 7 and 13. He said there's going to be an easier path, an easier road that they're going to preach to you. Oh, it's going to be a broad way. It's going to be wide and it's going to lead to destruction. Many are going to follow it and go there. He said, but let me tell you about an old path. Let me tell you about a straight gate, a narrow way. Because the old path is narrow. And that's why some don't want to go down because it's got too many restrictions on it. It's too narrow for me. It's too narrow-minded, preacher. We've got to be open-minded. We're in a modern age. God's changed his mind about something. No, he has not. Narrow. Now, that's too narrow for us. We've got to have a broad way. We'll go to New York. Yeah, Hollywood. Yeah. Huh? He said... Ask for the old paths. He told them, God is so anxious to get them to respond to him. He said, call out to me. Ask me for the old path. God was trying to let them know it's that path that's so narrow. that looks so unattracted to your worldliness. Come on, somebody, into the world. That's the way. He called it the good way. Ask for it. God, give me the old path. Somebody say, that's the good way. And then he didn't just say stand there and look at it. Walk in it. That means follow it. Walk down it. And somebody say this old path has got a promise. He said you'll find rest for your soul. 
No wonder so many people running the roads of life. Amen. Traveling. Amen. Glory to God down this road and this way and this path. Can't be satisfied. Can't be satisfied ever. Can't never have no peace. Can't never have no rest. Trying to find it at the end of here or the end of there. Amen. And they end up right back where they started. Amen. In a pit. In a cesspool of sin. But somebody shout the promise of rest. And I'm not just talking about here that's earthly. I'm talking about eternally. Everybody leaving this world ain't R.I.P. and resting in peace because there's an old path that leads to this rest that's eternal that I'm talking about. And Jesus said it's so narrow. He said, I am the way. I'm the path. I am the truth. I am the life. No man can come to the Father but by me. John 14 and 6. Somebody say it's so narrow. It's only one way. It's old path. Listen. Here's what made Jeremiah weep. But they said, we will not walk therein. Verse 17, also I set a watchman over you. Somebody say, that's the bishop. That's the overseer. Saying, hearken to the sound of the trumpet. Remember when the chapter started, the trumpet was sounding. Warning, flee this, flee that. But they said, we will not hearken. Means we hear, but hearken means we'll not listen, we'll not obey it. We'll not do what he, he's saying for us to do. Look how the chapter 6, Jeremiah 6 ends. Verse 30, he says, they're reprobate silver. That means they're rejected, refused. There's that word reprobate in the old covenant. Found it in the new covenant earlier as we was preaching from Romans 1. Shall men call them because the Lord hath rejected them. Right there is what reprobate means. You want to know what it means? You've rejected God so long, now God rejects you. You become a reject. Mm. What do you think it means when he says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice, open the door, I'll come in him and sit with him and he with me. Revelation 3.20, he's talking to his own people. That is not a scripture for the world. He's talking to his own people. And by verse 15 and 16, his accusation against them, and it's true, it's accurate. He said, you're lukewarm. He said, I'm going to spew you out of my mouth. That don't just mean the healer got sick and says, I'm about to vomit. But what he was saying, I'm going to eject you. I'm going to reject you. I'm going to let you have your church without me. I'm going to let you have it all, your life, without me. America's here. America's at that state. I wept on my couch yesterday, praying, praying. First I said, Lord, forgive me for not praying more than I do. There was a particular person live speaking, and I began to pray for his soul. And I said, God, there's a prophecy from one of your dead prophets that prophesied back in 2012 somewhere. Said he would be in the Oval Office, and he was, but said his second term, he'd be born again and spirit-filled. And I said, God, he didn't get that second time. God, if it ain't for nothing else, give America a second chance. One more time, let that be your prophecy. Let it be fulfilled. And I began to pray for America and pray because when you pray for America you're not just praying in general you're praying Pacific because according to Proverbs 29 and 2 when the wicked bear rule the people will mourn but when the righteous are in authority come on the people will rejoice anybody hear the Holy Ghost and I'm telling you America amen can be no more no less than those that are leading her that are in prominent places even politically oh anybody hear the Holy Ghost and I begin to weep I felt a burden come on my soul I began to pray God to rescue us one more time I said Lord I hold you to it you told me to prophesy in June of 2020 or July of 2020 that God was going to deliver America one more time and I said Lord deliver us deliver us it's going to take you it's going to take you to deliver us from this anarchy, from this antichrist movement. Come on, somebody. Oh, from the, all this brainwashing and hogwashing. Come on. And hallelujah. Me and Dylan filmed a mule yesterday on our way. We was going somewhere and we stopped and it was coming to us at the fence. I made a little joke about it. I told Dylan, I said, even that's going to offend somebody to watch it. Hallelujah. Because I said, oh, look, a church member. Praise God. Hallelujah. I should have said, no, look, a, a politician. Hey, man, that believes it's okay to kill 
babies. I should have, I believe I'll redo me one like that. Hallelujah. Come on, somebody. Oh, praise God. Somebody shout, God, it's going to take him. I don't know but one that can heal the land. According to God's word in 2 Chronicles 7 and 14, and somebody says the Lord, but God's people must repent of her wicked ways, her apathy, her lethargy, and stop rebelling against God's counsel when he says repent. Hallelujah. Unless we somebody say we'll repent or we'll become reprobate.